All right, let's try this again uh, now that a small uh, aircraft crashed somewhere around uh, the studio here. looks like all power and everything else is back on. Technology is wonderful uh, when you have power, uh, which is exactly what we needed to get back on here. So here we go once again, the college basketball tip-off show, Sweet 16 edition. We appreciate you guys hopping back on with us as we have got... And are ready to go here uh, to cover some questions about tonight's game. So uh, last I spoke, Vino, you were rudely interrupted about your breakdown here uh, with this bomb that went off uh, when it came to Gonzaga and uh, and Purdue. So please, if you wouldn't mind for those just jumping in, uh, go ahead and uh, tell us uh, your thoughts once again with the Zags taking on the five and a half point favorite uh, Purdue Boilermakers. Yeah, just a couple of things real quick here, Joe, that I think are keys to this game. You want to defend Zach Eady. Um, I, I don't know that Gonzaga is built the exact way to defend Zach Eady. Gonzaga has a lot of big guys. For those who follow Mountain West basketball last year, Graham E.K. was the big center for Wyoming. Now he's center for Gonzaga. And they've got about four guys. They could run 20 fouls at Eady tonight if they choose. I think the better way or the more disruptive way to attack Zach Eady is when you can drop quick guards down to slap at the basketball um, and sort of aggravate him. But still, they do have the potential tonight to use up fouls, to send him to the free throw line. He has had a couple of games, uh, two of the last three last at least, where he's been somewhat erratic from the free throw line. So perhaps that could be good here. Gonzaga's has really been good offensively, Joe. I mean, their numbers are still off the charts as an offensive unit here. Top 10 effective field goal percentage, top 10 adjusted offensive um, uh, rating. So they can play offense and they can play it at pace. I don't know that Purdue shies away from pace here. They certainly have a lot of three-point shooters um, in their arsenal. So you look at the total here, 154 and a half, 155. Uh, we've seen a little bit of push upward here. Can't really argue it. I think the best look for me in this game here, Joe, real quick, might be Gonzaga team total over. I'm just not sold on Purdue's defensive metrics. I've watched them enough to know that those numbers might be a little bit misleading. Um, and I think Gonzaga has plenty of ways to attack that. you got to shoot the basketball well, but I think they can attack that. So, uh, Teddy, how do you, uh, when you looked at this game here, uh, the Zags and uh, Purdue here, and again, it opened up, what, about four, four and a half? We're seeing fives now, uh, maybe uh, five and a half. Not a whole lot of crazy movement. It felt like maybe the Zags might be that trendy dog, that that one team that everyone, because nobody seems to be sold on this Purdue team, and yet they haven't really done anything to warrant that kind of skepticism. How did you look at this game when you thought about uh, when you were breaking it down? So first, let's be clear about what this line has done. All right. at the open. We saw pretty heavy money for Purdue, and this was five and a half everywhere. And now we've seen money show for the Zags, and now it's pretty much five everywhere. So there was an initial move towards Purdue. Now we've seen some buybacks to, uh, on, on Gonzaga, only a plus five and a half. But it's pretty much fives across the board right now. And while I don't like to disagree with my good friend and colleague, Rob Vino, I'm going to disagree with him here when it comes to Purdue's defense. I'm a believer in the Boilermakers defense. I've watched this team a lot. And certainly, you know, the Ken Palm number 15 in the country metrics, my mind, are very real. Um, you know, you don't get anything in transition against Purdue. You don't get anything in the post against Purdue. And you better be hitting three-point shots if you're facing this team because, you know, they're pretty good at, at keeping opponents out of the paint and out of good looks. Gonzaga's full-season results, and again, I know they got better down the stretch. But when you look at Gonzaga's full season results, there's only one thing that stands out like a sore thumb. When they play a really good defensive team, they lose by margin. They have four losses by margin all year, and they all came against the same kind of team. St. Mary's, UConn, San Diego State, and the first time they played Purdue. And all four of those teams, all four of those opponents, top 20 defenses, all four of those games are all, sorry, six of those games. They played St. Mary three times. All six of those games, problematic for the Zags' offense. I think Purdue can shut them down again. Uh, I really do. Um, so from a team total standpoint, 
Rob likes it over. I look for the Zags under. And looking for the Zags under here. Merrill, in this game, how much uh, stock do you put in? Uh, you know, again, we, we've kind of seen this game already. Uh, not to mention that uh, we saw it last year, too. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Purdue won both those uh, games there. Uh, it's just not, doesn't feel like it's the same Zags, but it certainly isn't the same Purdue team here. So when you look at Purdue heading into this game against the Zags, uh, what should we expect that was any different than what we already got? We saw the same thing with San Diego State last night. What the, We just watched this a year ago. Only one team got better, one team got worse. What do you think we're going to get in this one? Yeah, I mean, the one thing, as we've touched on, is that Gonzaga is playing better now, more cohesive team effort uh, than they were back in November. But what jumps out to me about last year's result back in November of 22 was that Purdue was a six and a half point dog in that game? We always talk about how Matt Painter underachieves. Well, a six and a half point dog winning outright as they did in that game, um, 84 to 66, not even close. An 18 point win outright as a six and a half point dog is overachieving, which shows maybe Purdue was even better than we realized. And then, of course, we can really dig into the meeting this past November because it's pretty much the same rosters, even though Gonzaga is playing a little bit better. And as Teddy mentioned, Gonzaga does not like the slow half court game, and that was a slowdown game, just 73 possessions. Uh, the total was at 154 and a half in that game, just like it is tonight. It landed at 136, Purdue 173, 63. And once again, second half adjustments, they outscored uh, Gonzaga by 15 points after halftime. So Matt Painter was not out coach, which goes back to maybe what Rob Vino's gotten me thinking about this week that Mark Few might be an overrated coach now. I never really thought that because although he has underachieved at times, you know, you always feel like that's still a mid major program coming out of the West Coast. Uh, so I don't think the coaching disadvantages as much as it might be in other matchups tonight. And I am liking Purdue more the, as the tournament goes on. And we talk about those efficiency rankings. I think they were like 19th when the tournament started. They're now the 15th mm. defense, the number three offense. 19 of the last 21 national champs have been 15th or better defensive efficiency. So they're in that sweet spot now. And the majority of the teams have been top nine or better, 18 of the 21, and they're third on offense. So they definitely have the metrics to go all the way, uh, despite what we might think of Matt Painter. Yeah, well, and we don't think much until he wins. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't know what to tell you. How's Coach Lloyd doing, uh, Vino? He, oh, yeah, that's right. He ain't playing squat anymore he ain't either. He about here. an hour, Some, Joe. I was going to say, he's uh, exactly, he's got tea time at the club here because – it's just the same old, same old, and uh, we'll see. Rick Barnes here tonight, of course, Matt Painter. And speaking of Rick Barnes, and a shout-out uh, to those of you joining us here via uh, YouTube, of course. We appreciate you guys, those watching on your mobile, on YouTube Shorts. Uh, welcome in. And also Instagram, we got a couple of great questions coming in on Instagram. And, Teddy, I'll come to you because Stock Tonk, uh 93 and I know I just butchered that name, uh, but that's uh, we'll just go with stock 93 it says Tennessee first half seems like a good bet. Tennessee comes out with strength. Creighton hasn't uh, seen a defense like the Vols thinks that maybe the adjustments Creighton could make would make them be a pretty decent look in the second half. But what do you think about Tennessee swarming and coming out in the first half? So I think Tennessee is better than Creighton. Potentially a good notch or two better than Creighton. Mm. And at no point this week was I even tempted to lay the price with Tennessee. And especially not now, after this line was minus two and minus two and a half, and now you're looking at three and a half, even fours uh, popping up as some of the leading indicator books. So if you do like Tennessee, A, you've missed the best of the number, and B, mm. you know, look, the Rick Barnes thing is no joke. <laughs> When you've lost money betting on a coach <laughs> once, twice, three times, 20 times in a same spot, guess what? At some point, you learn your lesson. I do not bet on Rick Barnes' teams in Sweet 16 games or Elite 8 games. If they rate the Final Four, I ain't betting them on them in those games either. All right? Probably mm -hmm. not anyway, uh, unless we get a whole lot of money. So I believe, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at this. The lean is Tennessee, but I ain't playing it. Mm, yeah. It, 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 and again, we talked about this yesterday on the show and uh, welcome in uh, Bill, uh, also uh, Sam, Killer J in the house. Hell of a uh, hell of a shot, Killer J, by the way. Uh, I saw you shooting some hoops yesterday. 
Uh, but we talked about this, uh, Vino. We um, we thought this might have been the one game where we said take out a coin and flip it. But what advice would you have for people looking to maybe split these games in half? Nobody does it better than you uh, in a game that is a coin flip. If you think Tennessee can overwhelm Creighton, maybe uh, would you be opposed to looking at them in the first half? Well, I mean, numbers would suggest, Joe, that they wouldn't overwhelm Creighton, right? If we're just going by season-long first-half winning margin, Tennessee ranks 16th in the country. They win first halves by 6.1 points per game overall. Creighton ranks 14th, two steps above, 6.2 points better than their opponent in the first half. So who's to say Creighton couldn't come out first half and make Tennessee have to adjust? It's really a lot of guesswork where that game is concerned in my mind. Um, and I'd rather react in game to what you see uh, in that instance. So as far as first half goes, I don't know that I could recommend either side. Uh, I will say this to the part of the smothering defense from the um, person in the chat room, stock 93, I think you said, right, Joe? Mm -hmm. um, yep. The biggest matchup advantage I see that would Give Tennessee that type of edge is at the point guard position. The one thing that I would somewhat worry about if you're Creighton is Stephen Ashworth, the point guard for Creighton, facing um, Zakai Ziegler for Tennessee, who is regarded as the best defensive point guard. You could argue it, but he's regarded by many as the best defensive point guard in the SEC. And as I stated yesterday, when you get to this point, I like to see ball pressure. Um, UConn last night went into ball pressure and absolutely shut San Diego State down for a stretch there. And when you can come outside the arc and get after the ball, which Ziegler does, could cause some early problems for Creighton. Um, if the pace is up and down the floor, those, those uh, problems diminish because it's more of an open floor game. But if it's a half-court setting, then I think that's one way where I could see Tennessee in that term smothering defense um, be in their favor. All right, good stuff there. We got uh, a couple more questions uh, coming in, guys. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you could for us, too. Become part of the Wager Talk TV family. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, don't forget to hit that little bell. Get all the notifications when we uh, when we have enough uh, power to actually stay afloat here. It'd be fantastic without a bomb going off in the background. Uh, but uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in here. Also, Merrill. Uh, let me ask you about this Houston and uh, Duke game. There is a lot of concern in the chat room uh, that Houston might have left it all out on the court uh, and that uh, maybe, uh, you know, that Texas A&M game, you say it all the time, Merrill. Nobody's better than you when it says, hey, you don't want to lose a game or you don't want to affect a game twice, right? Well, you know, they've had some time off here. Uh, when you looked at Houston and Duke, is it a good matchup for one or the other right on the uh, on the outset here? Well, the first thing that jumps out to me, I always look at pace, and both of these teams do prefer a slowdown. Obviously, Houston's one of the slowest teams in the league in the entire country each and every year. But Duke, once Krzyzewski's left the past couple of seasons, Duke has played much slower than they used to. They used to be a more up-tempo team under Coach K. So I do think the under could be worth a look, yet the money's actually coming in a little bit on the over in this game the last couple of days. Um, it is tricky. These totals are very tricky because this is a competitively priced game with a point spread of four, which means it goes down to the wire. If one team is up by a few baskets, you're going to have to foul. You can instantly get an extra 10 points. So that's where it gets tricky with the total. Um, first half under might be worth a look, but as is often the case in college basketball, they make you pay a price. It's always several baskets less, but at least it takes that foul uncertainty out of the equation. Um, but I do think both teams will be comfortable in the half court setting. And as I said at the top of the show, or the last show, we've spliced these into two episodes today, but if you missed the other 11-minute episode, I mentioned that um, this is one of those situations in which we have the underdog who has the better efficient offense, yet the weaker defense. And we saw that in two games last night, and both Alabama and Illinois won outright as underdogs with the better offense, weaker defense. Now, they had much weaker defenses in both those games. Mm. Duke is only a little bit weaker. They're still a top-20 defense um, Houston, the best D in the country for most of this season, along with Iowa State. Uh, we saw how that played out last night for the Cyclones. Duke isn't quite at the offensive level that Illinois is, but they're pretty efficient. In fact, they're more efficient than Houston. 
each and every year, Houston has, has everything it takes to win the championship. And they just seem to come up a little short. Uh, I believe they have more wins against top 50 ranked teams than anybody this season. Um, these are two teams that can make it all the way to the finals. This might be the most important game of the uh, Sweet 16 round. And one other thing I'll point out real quickly is if you look at that metric I mentioned earlier that 19 of the last 21 teams have had a top 15 defense when all is said and done, 18 of the last 21 have had a top nine offense. There's really only two teams left that are probably certainly going to be in that range if they keep winning, and that's UConn and Purdue. They could meet in the finals. By the way, they're on the opposite sides. Duke right now is at 5-20. and 20. They could get to that top 15 defense. Houston, 14-2. and two. I don't know if they can get to the top nine, but those are really the four teams remaining probably have what we quote-unquote call national caliber uh, potential, and they play each other tonight, two of them. Yeah, it should be a good game. And, uh, and Vino, before we, uh, we ask you about uh, a couple of pace questions here, I got to ask, Teddy, I'm being asked to just uh, push back on you, if you could, to clarify your non-betting of Rick Barnes. I don't think you met it all the time because they're pointing out, well, why wouldn't we bet him? He's won over 67% of his games over the last three seasons. We're not talking about blindly always betting. Uh, betting against uh, Tennessee, right? And Rick Barnes, you got you're just talking about certain situations. Rick Barnes in March. If you bet Rick yeah. Barnes every year in November, okay. I mean, I, I went back. Uh, I, I found a, a, a really interesting stat, and I went back and double checked it, and I was happy with the numbers. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Rick Barnes long term, November, December, sixty percent plus ATS. Rick Barnes, long-term March in the mid-30s, long-term oh. ATS. And that's a significant sample size over many, many years. It's not one or two plays or one or two bets. It's forever. Um, yep. So Barnes in March is not a coach that I trust. Yes. Barnes in the NCAA tournament is not a coach. November, December, love the guy. Not this yeah. year. Uh, great. Uh, I hope that clarifies it uh, there in the chat room. We certainly do appreciate it. And Vino, uh, Merrill uh, talked about it, and uh, there are some rumblings here in the chat rooms about uh, who dictates pace here at Duke Houston tonight, right? Because uh, a lot of people are fawning over how much Houston has been able to score uh, recently here. I mean, granted, it was a double overtime game, but they have certainly picked up the pace when needed to here. So. Why, what do you think we're going to get pace-wise with Duke and Houston here tonight? I wouldn't think much, and not if Houston has their way. I mean, maybe Duke, if you're the head coach from Duke, and again, you know, you could say I slept at a Holiday Inn Express last night because I like to play head coach on the air here. <laughs> but um, <laughs> if I'm John Shire, you don't want to come down and face Houston's half-court defense, but Houston plays slow enough to force you into that, and they rebound well enough to force you into that particular pace. Um, I think to the comment of our previous question, who was at it was talking mm -hmm. about Tennessee coming out and smothering people. Listen, nobody in the nation, nobody, zero teams, other than the teams that are in the Big 12 during conference season and the teams that played them in non-conference, play a defense like Houston's. And in football, Joe, we often use the analogy that it sometimes takes time, maybe a half, to get used to a service academy offense. You know, you can't simulate it in practice. You can't simulate a really fast team, their team speed in practice. You don't know it until it hits you in the mouth, the famous Mike Tyson quote, right? And mm -hmm. Houston's defense kind of is that in college basketball. Duke more than likely will have to adjust to what they see here. So I think where um I think our previous comment was Tennessee can come out and smother them defensively. I would be more apt to say that Houston is the type of team that come out and smother you defensively until you get used to it. And we've seen examples of it because Houston has blown second half leads, right? The Baylor yeah. game, for instance, big first half lead. Houston, um, for what it's worth, is the number one team in the nation in first half average scoring margin. I think they're like plus 10.2 yep. in the first half. A lot of that work done at home. This game is in Dallas. Duke fans travel. Houston's fans will travel. Should might probably be a split crowd um, for this particular game. But, you know, Houston lucked out. I, somewhere along the line, I don't know who said it, but there was talk about Houston left it all out on the floor. They had four mm -hmm. days off, and they had four starters mm -hmm. foul out 
Are you going to have four starters foul out again? I, I know Duke gets whistles, but unless that same referee crew that did the Texas A&M oh. game is showing up here tonight, oh. I don't know <laughs> if you know they give up 45 free throws or whatever it was that A&M shot and four starters foul out. So um, I think they've had plenty of time to recoup as far as their legs go. This is an interesting game, guys, because, again, Houston's been a really good first-half team, and I would trust them first half. Um, but the way they do give up second half leads in some instances, Oof. not necessarily as a season long because they've got a great record, right? But yep. there's been instances where they've given it up in the second half. So interesting game, Kelvin Sampson against John Shire. Which coach you want to be on? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one here, guys. But uh, best bets are locked and loaded for Teddy. Uh, for Double R One L, Steve Merrill, as well as Rob Vino here on the slate of games here tonight. A huge NBA card uh, coming up, too. We're going to talk uh, that uh, in just about 45 minutes or so, so don't miss the afternoon update uh, with the NBA here. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and become part of the Wager Talk TV family. Uh, Merrill, I've seen a lot of conversations and comments in the chat rooms about uh, Creighton's a Big East team. You're not going to overwhelm a Big East team. Well, we all thought the ACC sucked this year, and yet, uh, you know, we have an ACC team in, well, in, in the Elite Eight here. So let's not confuse the two. Two things can be true at the same time, right? Like your conference blew, but um, there is obviously an ability for a team to uh, to rise above that. We've seen Clemson do it here. How much do you handicap conferences when it comes to games that are happening right now? We could actually do it tonight because Marquette and NC State play the early game at 7 or 9 mm -hmm. Eastern, whereas Creighton and Tennessee play the late game at 10 o'clock Eastern. And the reason I bring that up is because Marquette and UConn obviously looked great last night. If Marquette looks really good, then yes, I think we have to bump Creighton a little bit for being in that Big East because... It was a very uh, top-heavy conference, maybe, but had two or three of the best teams in the country. And by the way, uh, UConn is 23-1 and since January 1st after their win last night. The only team that beat them during that span was Creighton. Now, it was a bad scheduling mm. spot for UConn because they blew out this Marquette squad that Saturday night by 28 points and then had to travel just one day rest to play at Creighton that Monday night. So it was a tough spot for UConn. Made sense why they maybe came up a little short. Um, I want to circle back to the Rick Barnes discussion real quick in that Tennessee-Creighton sure. game. He coached eight years at Texas, and he's been at Tennessee now for nine years. So that's the last 17 years. I went back and looked. He has never overachieved in the NCAA tournament once in 17 years. And what I mean by that <laughs> is you look at where his seed is and which round he went out. And his very first season at Texas, back in 2008, he made the Elite Eight. That's his best. It's his only Elite Eight ever, by the way, over this 17-year span. But he was a two seed. You're supposed to make the Elite Eight as a two seed. So he did not overachieve. He went out where he should. Vastly underachieved almost every other tournament. He has never gone past the round he should go. Most of the time, less. That's what we're talking about. 17 years. So at some point, you got to start taking that serious. Yet the money's come in on Tennessee tonight. It's gone from two to three. Now it's up to three and a half. I did my Fade the Public video overnight early this morning. The line was three. Now it's three and a half. So a little surprised by that line move coming in on Rick Barnes. Tennessee is the better defensive team, but as I've said a few times in the show last night, the two situations in which an underdog was the better offense, weaker defense, they both won straight up last night. That was with Alabama and Illinois. Creighton and Duke fit that scenario tonight. Yeah. Uh, Teddy, how, how much do you look into uh, an ACC team versus Big East team this time of year? Is it Does it matter to you where these teams are coming from at this point uh, at all? Does it play a role in it at, at all here? It reminds me of bowl season, all right? In bowl season, mm -hmm. we look, you know, over the first weekend and all of a sudden, whatever, teams from some conference get smacked around early, you know, pre-Christmas or even after Christmas. And you're like, oh, wow, this conference is 0-5 ATS in bowls. But their best team hasn't played yet or their best teams haven't played yet. So while there is something to be said for paying attention to how a conference is doing ATS in a tournament, Certainly long-term, just look at the Mountain West. <laughs> uh, yeah. It makes sense to pay some attention to this kind of stuff. But I'm never going to say, well, because the ACC has overachieved in this year's tournament, I'm going to bet only on ACC teams. Or 
because the Pac-12 teams are all gone, that you know, or, or because the other Pac-12 teams mm-hmm. are gone, I'm going to fade Arizona just because they're in the Pac-12. I mean, that for me is not a. If you're making a case, you can make a case and add that to the piece of the, as a piece of the puzzle. Yep. But it's certainly not a primary factor for me when handicapping these games. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good point there. And that Marquette game, uh, Vino, is the uh, is the last one up here that uh, folks are going back and forth. We're seeing this line move up to what seven now. We're starting to see it. Uh, they're starting to see it go here and. Uh, the big question is, does North Carolina State have a chance? So, well, of course, they. I mean, Clemson had a chance last night against number two seed, right? So Marquette has certainly looked the part so far. But quite honestly, NC State has been an enigma. I mean, teams have not been able to figure them out here at this point. So when you look at Marquette and NC State, it is one of the bigger numbers on the board. What do, what do you think in this one? Yeah, and it's been pushed that way, right? And yesterday um, mm. on our show here, we got a um, strong Marquette opinion from um, colleague Adam Trigger, who listed off a mm-hmm. lot of the reasons why he likes Marquette in this particular ball game. I, I say, Joe, I, I think this game probably becomes high scoring. And Marquette, since Cola came back, which is the first two games of this tournament, has shown typical Shaka smart traits where they want to get out and push pace, push pace, push pace. Um, They got a big lead against Colorado. They choked it away. That game became far closer than it had to be. Of course, you could say Colorado played really well in a come from behind effort too. So maybe choked it away is not a good phrase to use for that particular game, but it wound up 81-77. For NC State, it's been a lot of let's dump the ball down to DJ Burns because the opponent is overmatched down there. Not going to be the case really here with Marquette. And I think that Marquette's ability to push pace might, you know, it forces Burns obviously to run the floor. I think the guy on NC State that's not talked about enough at this point in time, because we tend to be fascinated by Burns, is DJ Horn, the point guard from Arizona State who transferred over. Kolick and Horn are both explosive guys. And Kevin Keats loves to run the floor as much as any coach in America, right? If you take a look at their numbers, Joe, and here's where these Ken Palm numbers can sometimes be misleading. Take a look at NC State and you say you see their number 147 in adjusted offensive tempo. Oh, well, 147, they're a methodical style team. But take a look at their average possession length on offense. Very, very short. Their possession length is on the defensive end where they force teams into the 302nd longest possessions in the country, 18 seconds per possession. Marquette's not going to allow that tonight. Marquette's going to mm. run, force it down their throat, not allow half court. It's very, very similar to what we saw with North Carolina last night. If you took North Carolina's metrics for granted and just said, oh, wow, great defensive team, number one in the uh, ACC, defensive efficiency, according to Ken Palm, not putting into account that Alabama was never going to let them get into half court sets, and you wind up on the wrong end of an 87-85 loss, right? So it, it, sometimes you have to look a little bit differently at those numbers that Ken Palm presents. And here, I think it's going to be two teams that like to run. Both teams are explosive. Um, another thing really quick here is if for anybody who watched the Colorado game, how many times did Tyler Kolick drive to the rim and make left-handed layups against Colorado? Oh, I, and, and when, when you take, take it away. Account, yeah. <laughs> the, the two guys... Yeah. That were down low for Colorado are very similar to the two guys, Burns and Diara, that are going to be down there for NC State tonight. And in fact, Diara is probably going to have to leave the rim to go guard David Joplin, who can shoot threes as a stretch four. So Marquette's got components. To sum up a long story short, Marquette's got components to force NC State defensively out of what they've been successful at here. And I think you probably get into a track meet style game, which is what Shaka Smart wants, who's going to shoot it better. I think there's probably plenty of opportunities for both. Teddy, uh, I'm going to ask you, too. I mean, you looked at uh, Tennessee. You looked at Creighton. You looked at North Carolina State and uh, Marquette. It's one of the highest numbers on the board. Tell the fine folks what you got locked, loaded, ready to go here tonight, and give us your thoughts on this uh, Marquette team taking on the, uh, what, number 11 seed, North Carolina State? Yeah, we have uh, a very rare 5% big ticket play going tonight in college <laughs> basketball action. I've released a grand total of two of them all year. They are 2-0 and so far. Number three uh, goes this evening. It's been a great tournament. 
uh, for the clients. And I am riding a 20 and seven college basketball run, six and two uh, with the last eight in big dance action. So we're making money right now. You can get that play at Wager Talk or sportsmemo.com. I love Shock as smart as a dog come tourney time, but not so much as Chalk. <laughs> you know, his teams, and we saw it against Colorado. You know, they found a way to blow a lead, win by only four. It's certainly not the first time that's happened. And we talk about where these two teams are priced. Marquette's top 25 offense, Marquette's top 25 defense. There are no power rating bargains for the Marquette Golden Eagles right now. NC State, you can ask a legitimate question. Is this 7-0 straight up an ATS run or 6-0-1 ATS or 6-1 ATS, depending on where you bet them, uh, in their last game, uh, which bounced around the number? Is this just a hot streak? Or is this team's full season numbers lying? Are they power rated wrong right now? Mm. You make an argument that they're power rated wrong right now. This is an undervalued commodity. You know, I understand seven wins in 11 games. Now you take some time off. Maybe they're right. I think it's too many points. You know, I could only take the dog in the NC State market. Yeah, good point. Uh, Merrill, uh, tell the folks what you got out of here. And then uh, looking ahead here, Illinois, UConn, Clemson, Alabama. Any initial thoughts here about uh, what we're getting? Yeah, well, first of all, looking ahead to Saturday, I will have an Elite Eight video for both Saturday and Sunday, both days here on Wager Talk TV. My Friday night Sweet 16 preview for all four games in depth where the public is, where I lean on the sides and totals is available for free right on the channel now. But be sure to check back Saturday and Sunday for two more videos this weekend for the Elite Eight. So hit subscribe and click the bell as well when you do so, so you get instant alerts. Um, my initial thought on the uh, the games tomorrow um, you know, as is often the case, it's going to come down to tempo and pace of play. And mm. we talk about that with a lot of games tonight, like this NC State Marquette game. Marquette prefers a little faster. Rob mentioned how NC State likes to slow scenes down defensively. Uh, so pace will probably be the key there. But then we look at the early game tomorrow, Illinois, Connecticut. Illinois, best offensive team in the country. Well, not anymore. UConn actually passed them last night. So we have the two best offensive teams in the country efficiency playing each other. Mm. Yet the total has dropped a bit from 155 and a half down to one. 54 and a half in some locations, 155 in others. UConn is a slow half court team, though. Illinois likes to play fast. So, two really good offensive teams. The question is, will UConn slow it down and play their excellent defense as well? And then the late game, you know, Clemson, unless NC State pulls the upset tonight, Clemson will be that Cinderella team as a six seed, not much of a Cinderella. And they're 19th now in the Ken Palms against Alabama. Two teams have both won straight up as a dog last night for the late game. Uh, that total has been bet down as well from 165 and a half down to 164, 164 and a half, uh, holding steady with Alabama minus two and a half. UConn, by the way, holding steady at eight and a half. And boy, is that a big price mm. against one of the best offensive teams. But you got to lay it uh, recently if you played it with UConn because they've won, what is it, eight or nine straight tournament games, and every win has been by 13 points or more, including that blowout last night. So there's no question you're paying a premium. In fact, last night I stayed off UConn because my power ratings made the game nine. It went up to 11, closed as high as 12. I still liked UConn. I just didn't want to give up that much line value, and they still blew them out. So no question, uh, UConn is going to be the L.A. Dodgers of this tournament the rest of the way. You're going to be paying a premium when you lay that kind of number. Um, as far as tonight, I do have three strong best bets in basketball, two in the tournament, and also one of the better NBA plays I've seen all season. Seriously, I know we're talking college hoops, but there's a great NBA opportunity tonight as well. So a three-for-one special plus a bonus free play in the NBA, Steve Merrill, wagertalk.com. And, of course, I'll be back in about an hour with you and Teddy talking more NBA and taking the viewer questions live here on Wager Talk TV. You know, just lay the run line, right? It's the Dodger. Oh, no, wrong sport. Uh, <laughs> that is the run line. Say, let everybody, but hey, bro, <laughs> Eight and is the run line, here. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> tell, that's exactly correct. Uh, talk to me here, Vino. Tell the folks what you got locked, loaded, and ready to roll here tonight. A uh, huge NBA card, 12 games coming up here tonight, no doubt. Uh, you've got your eye on a few of them. Yeah, and, and real quick, Joe, I, I'll go back a few steps here to when Teddy was talking about Rick Barnes being um, poor in March. I went back just to look for the numbers because I thought I had it right. In NCAA tournament action, after the most recent non-cover against Texas, Rick Barnes's teams in this NCAA tournament are now 4-18 and 18 against the spread. And that's what he means by, you know, love him in November, December. 
you don't necessarily love him at this time of year. He's not covering any games for you. Um, for tonight's card, I have three plays across the uh, Sweet 16, four games. So three plays up and available right now, three top plays. You can get them all, wagertalk.com on my home page. And watch me promo here real quick, Joe, because I won't mm. venture too far into tomorrow's games yet because I'll be part of the Wager Talk Last Call crew tomorrow morning where we'll discuss yes. those games. So I'll, I'll hold my uh, or reserve my comments until we go off tomorrow morning. For those who want to join in, it's an 11 a.m. tip-off for the Wager Talk Last Call show yep. Saturday morning. You can get all the latest info on these games from us at that point in time, late analysis, late opinions on those games. So once again, uh, tune in to Wager Talk Last Call tomorrow on Wager Talk TV where I'll be part of the crew. Um, as for, the, you know, really quick, the UConn thing being overpriced, when you see their margin of victory over their last mm-hmm. nine games, I mean, you could almost double their price and they're still going to cover yeah. for you. Last night was ridiculous. Exactly. Um, it's, it's just crazy. The odds makers can't catch up to how good this team really is. And uh, we'll see if it continues or not. But as we mentioned last night, we were texting back and forth. Danny Hurley, 10-0 against the spread Oof. with this UConn team the last two years in this tournament. That's uh, for all the stuff we've talked about as far as head coaches we don't want. I mean, that's probably the guy that's top of your list as a guy you do want. Yeah, there's a handful of them here, and one, a couple are still there. And uh, it should make for some great action here, not just tonight, uh, of course, but uh, tomorrow over the weekend, Elite Eight, Final Four coming up. And we have got you covered here. And uh, like uh, Rob said, uh, join us uh, tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern time for Last Call. We'll give you all the latest information you need on those games and uh, a loaded card across the board. Major League Baseball, of course, NBA, college basketball. Uh, We've got it all here for you. So go ahead, hit the uh, subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Become part of the Wager Talk TV family. Hit that like button. Have a very happy holiday, uh, those of you this weekend that will be celebrating. I'm still having a hard time figuring out that Easter is here, uh, but it is. So enjoy the weekend. And don't forget, coming up in about 45 minutes, everything you need to know with the afternoon NBA updates. 12 games on the card here tonight. A lot of opportunities. I hope you'll come back and join us. Until then, best of luck with your plays. We'll talk to you again soon.